You know, originally there was a beat done in an old analog drum machine over there, Metasonic's one, filled around with a bit in the computer. And then normally when we're working, well, Trent's moving around, but I'm generally here. <laughs> <laughs> so Trent's sitting there with his guitar and a whole bunch of pedals, and we just record. And it's like, what you'll get is, you're obviously going to hear the beat, and then you're just going to hear raw footage from that day of... I think the challenge for me as a composer on this was everything I've written up to this project has been assuming that I'm making something for your ears to pay attention to and your brain to fill it in from there. I'm not supporting something else necessarily. I'm not trying to be supportive of a picture or dialogue or anything else. I'm hoping that when you're listening to music, that's what you're doing, you're listening to my music. So I'll dress the set with the sound and the mood and the texture and I'll usually put that actor in the middle that's my voice or uh, a melodic thing that becomes the center stage. Now, thinking in terms of this film, there was a lot of talking. You know, and there was a lot of, you needed to pay attention to what was being said, and there's not a lot of space where there's not talking. And there's not lots of landscape scenes where the music can come up to the forefront while you're just watching something pretty or scary. It's, you're paying attention to these characters which are engaged in verbal jousting and lots of information coming your way. So let's get out of the way, but provide enough that it doesn't get boring with people just in a room talking about stuff. This is our kind of laboratory where we work. And over the years, this move, room has moved from New Orleans to various locations in Los Angeles, but how it is right now is we are very familiar with how everything sounds, so this is kind of our, our band, our orchestra. We know what we can milk out of these various pieces of gear. I think the way that we work on things isn't necessarily a very common, like I haven't, you know, it's not like I work with a million people, but I work with enough people to know that we work in this different way. Our creative process usually goes something like um, we'll discuss kind of what we think we were going for, then I'll go into my own head and I take off the editor's cap and I just kind of impulsively generate bits of melody or parts while he's recording them and we're sometimes looking at each other and we know what parts are, I think I know what's good occasionally and if I noodle in on something I'll stay on that for a while but it's all performance based, it's never stopping and thinking and talking. There he is experimenting. Understand that, so we just start and we'll nod at each other, like, okay, here's something that seems like it might be good. So, after maybe anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour of a solid performance of us kind of psychically communicating, I need to leave the room because I'm sick of what I'm doing and I'm frustrated by the end, usually. And then he tends to go through that and pick out sometimes what I think was good, sometimes things I didn't think were good arranges them in a blend that when I come back fresh after walking around the block or just being out of the room for an hour or so, now it sounds like a new piece I wouldn't have come up with. And now we take it from that point on. So then we get to hear, you'll hear you remember the first sound I played you? This is the other sound I nodded at you at. That's looping, put it in over the beat. 
the sound right now, didn't you? That becomes that first bit, you know, when she's going down on him and... This, because we're thinking like a saxophone, just a cut piece of guitar. There's a response to it. Another cut. Things start to change in the scene. You know, we've got some sense moving through the noise into comfortable but melodic. Our first batch of stuff that we delivered was really meant to be, let's just see what resonates with David. Here's some swatches, you know, tack them on the wall, see if anything feels. Do you like this kind of approach? Do you like these sounds? Should we be more this way? Should it be more up? Is it far too heavy? Maybe we'll hit it with one or two that he does actually like. But let's just get an, an idea of what, what kind of music we're going to be creating here. And when we were creating the music, again, we weren't thinking of it to particular scenes or to picture. It was, let's try to make interesting music that sounds like music you know, in the forefront. We turned it in, and we were, you know, waiting for that email back to see, you know. But assuming that that was going to be the first of maybe, you know, countless attempts or approaches. And we happened to really hit it right off the bat. gave the bulk of music in and came into that first spotting session, Ren had put some early ideas of maybe this could work here or maybe this could work there, you know, that we would then take and refine. But what was interesting about that and what was actually great about it was, I think there was a juxtaposition that we might have thought, wow, that could be too dark for that bit. But having someone to bounce off like that and then see, wow, it really does work well you know, and, and feel and sound unusual. And then we took that as a kind of place to jump off from and went back, you know, with this, you know, like you say, a kind of formal spotting session, some early ideas of what could work where, and then just carried on from there. That's when it became much more traditional, I'm guessing, um, scoring work, where now we're fitting stuff in around things. And David had cut a lot of things, or started to cut things, rhythmically, that were in concert with what we were doing musically. That's when I know we both had goosebumps watching, and, and in particular that title scene, where the track we call Hand Covers Brews plays. When we wrote that, I don't think we were both thinking, here's the main title theme, you know. Right. But seeing it in there, I was amazed, and this is the first time I've done this, but I was amazed at how much the music could change your expectation of the film and your impression and set the whole tone. And Not that I didn't know music could do that, but seeing it do that, and it was pretty, pretty eye-opening and, and just exciting experience to witness and be a part of. Trent Reznor sent over 16 different musical sketches between three and a half and eight minutes long. It wasn't really scored to any specific point. It was just kind of like he said, 
well, here's an idea and here's an idea. And I was sort of thinking of this for this, but we'd sort of move stuff around and edit things and sort of fit it. And then that track started playing. I think it was track seven, ironically. I was in my office and I was scrolling through a little MP3 and all of a sudden I heard this weird, it's almost like liggety, the shining kind of like this odd dissonance, this guttural sound. And then over the top of it came this little piano melody. And I heard it and I said, that's the main titles. It was kind of astounding because it seemed to talk about this loneliness. The piano was this lonely, it was almost childlike, and yet it had this kind of seething anger, vitriol, that was sort of bubbling under it. What I liked about that piece was it felt, the melody felt grand to me, and it felt bold and melancholy, tragic, important in some sense. But to be honest with you, I wasn't sure how dark or isolated David wanted this movie to come across. Because seeing a real rough cut with other music in there, tempt in, it really made the whole film feel different. It felt much more casual with a, with a jangly rock guitar track in that opening credit scene. It felt, ah, okay, it's a, it's a college movie about kids, you know, making stuff and screwing each other over. But with that other thing in there, with our thing, it suddenly felt like some, something's going on beneath the surface here. And there's a tension and a, and a vulnerability in there that I think changed the whole tone of the movie. And it was that moment where I started talking to Ren Kleiss and to, and to uh, Angus Wall and Kirk Baxter, and we started saying, well, this might be a triptych. This might be, we could connect this first affront or the first um, possibility of what he can become in this moment of, of uh, discord. And we could connect it to the deposition, his, do I have your full attention? And we could play it under there. Is that a question? In the 16th email, you raised concerns about the site's functionality. Were you leading them on for six weeks? No. Then why didn't you raise any of these concerns before? It's raining. I'm sorry? It just started raining. Mr. Zuckerberg, do I have your full attention? No. And then even play it in, in the sort of betrayal of Eduardo when Eduardo finds out that, that his um, stock has been liquidated. And what was your ownership share diluted down to? 0.03%. You signed the papers. You set me up. You're going to blame me because you were the business head of the company and you made a bad business deal with your own company. This is going to be like I'm not a part of Facebook. It won't be like you're not a part of Facebook. You're not a part of Facebook. My name's on the masthead. You might want to check again. Once we knew that was going to be the theme and it reoccurs at different points, we wanted to kind of, um, as Zuckerberg's character travels through um, the various consequences and realizations, and you see his kind of rise and decline at the same time, we wanted to make that piece feel like it evolved. And as it re reoccurs, it comes back in a little more beat up form or a little less bold as it might have seemed at one time. And that melody, which can sound kind of triumphant now, kind of sounds defeated in a sense. And it worked. And it worked in all three of those places with like little or very minor modifications. And we actually, um, uh, Trent did an interesting thing where he, like we sort of tried a bunch of different sounds for what the piano would be, an electric piano and, a, and an upright piano and a, and a grand piano and in different environments, you know, ringing out and being very full or with the, with the cabinet closed or with the top open or we tried miking it very close and miking it very far away and we ended up listening to all these different pianos and f sort of had this idea that the first one would be this very intimate, simple kind of piano, but full. So I think it was an upright piano that was recorded very close. And then the next time we hear it, it's, uh, it's recorded a little further away. It's, a, it's almost like a memory of who he was at the beginning. And 
by the time you get to the end, it's so distant. Like the, the actual piano itself is recorded from, a, you know, it's almost like who was who he was then is is all but but disappeared. And it was an interesting emotional thing. You hear it and you commit it to memory. And then the second time you hear it, there's something slightly different about it. And then the third time you hear it, it's like, it's like, a, like a, a memory of childhood. shot everything that had been finished for quite some time but that the Henley Regatta scene was filmed at Henley Regatta which apparently is 4th of July so we were pretty much finished with the bulk of the film but the scene had yet to be shot and he said I want to have something appropriate and what about this track you know and we listened to it and he said what if it was done as if Wendy Carlos did it okay you know and we just got done saying I can't believe how kind of easy this whole thing has been, you know, like not, not to brag, because we were not expecting that. But we kind of, you know, it's every, the planets have aligned and we haven't had to get our hands dirty that much. And that, not that there hasn't been challenges, but, well, then that request came in. And we started, and really the reason it took a long time was, um, I'll take the credit for taking it the wrong direction. I took Wendy Carlos literally, you know, so it became a kind of switched on Bach comical nightmare. I know the two of us, our engineer, uh, anyone else nearby, my dogs, if they ever heard that track again, they were about to, you know. It's a good melody, but when you hear it 20,000 times a day. 10 hours a day a for three solid weeks, you know, <laughs> it, 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 uh, it was enough. You know, but finally, once the approach was right, then there was an awful lot of tinkering to kind of orchestrate this piece that, you know, if you're going to take on that track, it needs to be pretty, pretty great. And, um, now I'm really happy with the way it came out. Then he filmed with that piece in mind and the tempo. When we saw the end result, it was like, okay, no, that was worth it. When it finally got approved, if it hadn't got approved that day, we probably would have killed ourselves. <laughs> yeah, it was at that, it was at that point.